You are listening to the Lawyer Stories Podcast with host Benny Gold. Lawyer Stories was founded in July 2017 and is an expanding global network of lawyers and law students sharing their personal journeys to the noble profession of the practice of law. Join us on this podcast as we dig deeper into these stories and hear from lawyers and law students from around the world in all areas of the legal profession. Here at Lawyer Stories, we believe that every lawyer has a story. What's yours? Welcome to the Lawyer Stories podcast with Benny Gold, uh, episode 54. Today we welcome in Dustin Hoff, trial attorney at Christensen Law. Uh, Dustin comes as part of a series we're doing with the uh, with Christensen Law, uh, and we're very pleased to have him today. Thank you, Dustin, for being here. How are you? Very well, thank you, Benny. And I got to say um, from the start, congratulations. Uh, and thank you for letting me be your uh, fourth anniversary guest. That's thanks. Uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. As the as the recording uh, today, July eighth, this won't be released for a few weeks, but two or three weeks. But um, it is the four year anniversary of Laura Stories. So we all we started with a little Instagram account and just kept going and going and going, and we executed. And we I do appreciate those sentiments, Dustin. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's been great to watch your not only your rise, but um, I'm I'm a fan of the cool. podcast. I've watched the podcast. Good, uh, just do a great job and have. I hope I can live up to as interesting as a lot of your guests are. Thanks, man. Well, I I really do appreciate that. And I I read your story earlier. We have not featured you on the feed. I'm looking forward to doing so. I have that information. Um, but you do have uh, an inter interesting perspective, and I'm definitely. Looking forward to getting into it a little bit with you here. Um, so what's going on there in Michigan? So you're in the Southfield office, like sort of near uh, Detroit, I guess. Uh, I've been to Michigan a few times, as I said. Um, I don't. I think I was like kind of far away from Detroit. But uh, anyway, tell me about what's happening. Well, it's been very hot and humid and uh, yeah. lots of thunderstorms overflowing our parking lot. I wish it was uh, a little bit... Uh, the sun was down a little more. You got a lot of sun coming through the back uh, shades here. It looks like, yeah, I can see. Yeah, which has been odd the last few days, but uh, things are going things are going well Good. in Michigan. Um, you know, as the as COVID is the state's lifting a lot of restrictions, trials are starting to go again. Civil trials, criminal trials, uh, obviously first. Yep. We're excited to get back into the courtroom. Right. I've been this. Tomorrow will be the first time I've been in a courtroom since March of 2020. Okay. So that, that's exciting. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see. I have not experienced any of the, the sneeze guards or how many people they allow in, any, anything like that. So it'll be a new experience. Really? So were you doing a lot of hearings on Zoom and that sort of thing? Everything was being done Zoom. Yeah. And we were fortunate. Our Supreme Court, it was working so well not only for attorneys, because, you know, you're just so more productive, right? You can right. be doing so much more. You're not wasting that drive time sitting in court, but also for litigants, you know, they can just pop out for lunch or, you know, take right. 15 minutes to jump on, jump on. And if it was a criminal case, you know, do it, do their hearing, or there was a settlement conference coming on to talk to the judge and right. know their perspectives. So our Michigan Supreme Court has recognized that. Good. And yeah. base and come out and said, "Hey, look, if you can do things via Zoom, that's how we're we're gonna do it from now on." It's amazing, that's you know, phenomenal. It's such like a it's such a um, fast moving technological world, and then like we we enter this COVID thing, and then you look at the legal perspective under like a different microscope, and they're actually changing it a little bit to make hearings in some jurisdictions like more. Uh, accessible, like if you don't need to, if we, if we can get this done without you piling into court, like let's do this. I mean, I had to sit in on some landlord tenant matters and you know, that you, you sign on the clerks there, you know, and then they send you into this like room with all the people mm -hmm. waiting. And it's just, it's amazing how these things evolve, but I think it could actually be a little more efficient in certain circumstances. Um, do you have thoughts on that? I, I agree. I think it's, it just got thrown at us. I didn't know what right. Zoom was a year and a half ago. Yeah. Of course. I think I had done, you know, we called them, I don't even remember what we called it when we would have to take, say, a deposition of somebody in Texas or England or, or wherever they were. Yep. And you were clunky at it and you didn't really know what you were doing and you're trying to get your exhibits together. And now 
I almost prefer it. I think it's faster, efficient, if you adapt to the technology. Zoom has been great in that they, um, that's primarily what we use. Uh, they have these little tutorials, but we even had judges that were doing tutorials for other attorneys, you know, older attorneys that really, you okay. know, Oh, aren't, in the, yeah. aren't into e-filing or right. into all oh, that God. it's crazy i mean they went from having the e-file in the last three years to look we're doing this motion on on um, on zoom that must have driven, driven them nuts yeah well so uh, if you're outside of really the metro area metro detroit area or um maybe lansing or kent county the po larger populations it's paper file still uh, absolutely. Okay. There's, right. we're, we're still transferring over to the e-file. And then if you're in district court, it's, I don't think there's any e, uh, any e-file for any district courts. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, yeah, that makes sense. It's been, it's just an interesting time to have all that stuff going on. So, so we, like I said, we haven't featured you yet, but I'm, I'm interested to like, just jump into your story. Um, and, and before I actually, before I do that, I do want to mention one thing, like, this just kind of came to mind, like Christensen Law, like, um, was it the school, university, like you guys had, like, I, I just wanted to give you guys a shout out with that again, because I thought that was like a terrific idea. And I was just speaking to somebody else. Um, you guys had like in-house, like, um, school, right, for like kids. And is that what it was? It was really out of necessity. Yeah. Um, we had, so a lot of our staff were a pretty uh, other than Dave Christensen and his wife and Deb Tonelli, I'm not sure she's another attorney to talk to. Everybody else here is like 45 to early 20s, younger, yep. uh, and everybody pretty much has kids or children right. in that age group that are, you know, either kind of the kindergarten, first, second, third, few high schoolers. Yep. And when COVID hit, schools were shut down or you could right. only go one day or two day. We were fortunate. We had some extra space in our building, and we were able to find uh, a couple of retired teachers Amazing. who were able yeah. to come in and work with the kids, and it was phenomenal. The one-on-one yeah. -on -one that they got, it's just yeah. I mean, that, I, I wish I would have had that. You know, yeah. I mean, that's incredible. Um, because and it's something I just wanted to bring up again because you know I saw it on your social media again, and I heard about it, and I just think that's a terrific thing that you did because a lot of um, working parents struggled with that, like having to, you know, they had these Zoom meetings and then they were expected to watch their kid while they were trying to be on these these Zoom meetings. So it, you know, it's an air, it's a front new frontier for everybody. But I just want to like give you guys more. Um, I want to give you guys a lot of credit for for really adjusting and for Christians in law being able to do that. So uh, congrats to you all. Yeah, um, so. You. Let's jump into your story a little bit. Speaking of kids, when you were like five years old, Dustin, you told your family, you're like, hey, I'm going to go to Harvard Law <laughs> and, and I'm going to be the president. And then you said like they didn't, you know, some some parents would might be like a little encouraging about it, but like your family like wasn't too encouraging. So like, what was that all about? I mean, if you recall, I mean, that might have been sort of a long time ago. I, you know, I, I do recall, uh, I don't think it was anything out of ill will at, at, at by any means, I, I guess to put it in context, my family, uh, well, I'm like sixth generation, my family immigrated from Germany in the late 1800s, but my family immigrated to an area where Sandusky, Michigan is yep. where I'm from. That's the postal code, but I didn't actually grow up there. I grew up about six miles south of there which doesn't sound like that far, but we count country, country miles, we count in minutes. Okay. So Dusky is like 2000 people. Where I live is more of a, a cul-de-sac uh, off, of off of a road. Okay. Maybe one car comes down our road uh, a day. Yeah, um, that's and, great playing football games out there, I'll tell you. It, it, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, f football, is, sports are big out there, families yep. big out there, faith's big out there. It's a conservative area, R rural, agricultural. Um, but my family, um, my great grandparents built a house across the street. My his, my grandparents then built a house, and my parents built a house across the street from them in yeah, this cul-de-sac. And then my brother goes and lives in the great grandparents' house. So it, generations, we you know we we stayed there. We were all blue collar. 
Um, not a lot of people went to, to school. Was there some sort of blue collar work that your family was doing like more than another? My mother was a social worker. Uh, she went back when she was 45 years old. She um, had five kids at home, decided that she was going to go get a degree in social work and wow. did it and did it awesome, you know, wow. rocked it out. She was very successful okay. in doing it, but it, it was man, manual labor. Um, you know, yep. my brother, both my brothers still, you know, uh, work in uh, shops. Yep. Uh, my, you know, my sister sells insurance. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's always been real blue collar. Growing up, I, I did construction. Yep. Paid for um, going to the college in the summers. What I would go and do construction, uh, build pools, things like that. How did you even like know about Harvard Law though, as a kid? Like, did you see it on TV? Did you watch oh, yeah. the 1973 hit classic, The Paper Chase? Or like, how did you know about Harvard Law? I never heard of Paper Chase till I was actually in law school. Oh, it's incredible. One of my favorites. Yeah, I've seen it. Seen the series. Oh, absolutely great. Yeah, you know, I think it's just one. Well, of I, I think there is a television show, but I'm mm -hmm. I'm referring to the the movie. There's a movie. Yes, yeah. There's the movie. Then they did like a, a kind right. of. A yeah, I didn't. Show. I never saw any of that, but sure. Yeah, uh, that was when Netflix. I had gotten Netflix right when it began. What was still a mail order service, and that was one of the first things I watched from there. <laughs> but to answer your question, I think it, it. You know, just like University of Michigan, Harvard is every. You know that when you're a kid, that's kind of success. Same as president, a lawyer, a doctor. It's just those traditional right. American Americana of what you want to be when you grow up. Right, and I, right. I, pro I don't know that I had any actual real desire at that time. It was just, you know, that's what you were going to do if you were going to make your parents proud, make your family proud. Right. And they got that, you know, oh, that's, that's cute. You know, but that's probably not going to happen. Right. So they, so, but you became a lawyer and you went, you know, you went to high school, obviously you were maybe you excelled in high school, like to college, you went to some, you went to, did you go to college out in Michigan, like some small schools out there? Mm -hmm. Is that what you did? What I was did. that like? What was that like? It was just, it was uh, intimidating. I, so I, town I grew up, the whole county was 50,000 people. Right. And I went, I only went about an hour away from home to college, Saginaw Valley State University, Division II school. At the time, I think there's probably about 8,000 students there, which probably for you know places in California is a high school. Um, it was uh, it was a good experience. It was my first experience being in the city, living in the city. But I was a, I was a chemistry major. I mean, so I at that time had no thoughts uh, of going to law school. So did, so let me let me ask you this. Like I think I brought up in the last uh, show that I did. Like with Michigan State and University of Michigan, did you grow up like thinking, you know, I want to go to one of those big schools or like that didn't interest you at all? It, I don't know that it was so much that I didn't know anybody that went to University of Michigan or Michigan State. So okay. you kind of, depending on where you grew up geographically, that's your allegiance to the schools when it comes to sports. Right, right. And I always liked Michigan State sports because I think they're like kind of the underdogs. Okay. But there was never, um, I didn't know anybody there. So it wasn't like a legacy school for me right? Uh, to, to go to either one of them. And, uh, you know, when I graduated from high school, uh, I knew I wanted to go to college because that's what you did. That's what everybody told you you were supposed to. I had, I had no idea. Um, I liked chemistry in school and I was good at it. So that's how I ended up. So then, okay. So then you, you went to law school, like you went to a school that I believe I applied to as well back in the day I went to Roger Williams in Rhode Island mm -hmm. um, so it's and I believe it Cooley right it is yeah it's that part western Michigan now so yeah what oh it's western Michigan so I actually just did a, a little speaking engagement so for the um the Florida Association of Women Lawyers at Cooley in Tampa like mm -hmm. last week that was cool so so like did you take time off before law school or did you go right to law school oh no I uh I graduated from uh college and I went to work. I worked for four years or so. What were you doing? I, I was working kind of in this capacity as a community liaison, working in politics a little bit because I had some political aspirations. Uh, just kind of nothing that I was happy with, making a, a good wage and livable wage. Yep. In fact, I made more money 
before I went to law school, then I did my first job out of law school. I feel like that happens often. <laughs> yeah, which but absolutely, it was a shocker to me. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I liked what I did, but it was just wasn't, it wasn't something that I wanted to get up every day and do and was passionate about. So, so I hear that you, at 28 years old, you just said, I'm going to quit this job. And we're, sorry, we're, you don't have to say where you're working, but can you just tell me the industry once again? It was like government politics. It was a nonprofit that I was working with. And um, I was doing a lot of like housing grants, writing housing grants, okay. um, community relations kind of uh, with us in the government agencies. Okay. It was, you know, and I shouldn't say that. It was probably, for a lot of people, a probably very fulfilling job. And there, right. and there was nothing wrong with that job. It just wasn't giving me that. Right. That internal. So what made you want to go to law school? Like, when did you turn and say, besides when you were five, there had to be something else because you worked for a few years after undergrad. So, like, when was that moment that you were like, I'm going, I'm no fly? Well, I can remember the moment when I decided that I was okay. going to apply, uh, but building up to, I always wanted to go, but again, is I didn't know, I didn't know any lawyers growing up. I didn't yeah. really know what they did. Um, I didn't think that, you know, I had the mentality for it or the grades for it or the smarts for, you know, all of those internal characteristics and the, the external factors, they very expensive. Uh, but I, so I had a friend from college that called me up one day and said, you're never going to guess what? I took the LSAT and I got into law school. And I was shocked because yeah. I would have never thought she ever wanted to go to law school. Like in the whole time I had known her, or even up to then. So we'd known each other, I don't know, at that point, maybe 10 years. Yep. Never once said, eh, I think I'm going to go to law school. Okay. Uh, she I went to school to be a teacher. Right. And so when she told me, she, she said, look, if I can do it, you can do it. And that was really the thing that gave me the impetus to go and do it. And I took the, took the LSAT, um, enrolled, did well enough, uh, enrolled and started, I think, I think it was like the next f fall from that time. What was your law school experience like? Difficult. Um, I really, I looked at it as that I had taken this risk of quitting a job, moving, hours away from home, no family, no friends. So I, I, I taught, I, I looked at it as it was my job. I was going to spend right. eight hours a day working on this. And I, like I said, I didn't study real well in undergraduate and kind yeah. of screwed yeah. around. And I was 28. So I was a little bit older than that, I think. Do you years. think there was an advantage to that though? Like being 28 in law school? I mean, I, I would think that through, I took one year off. But I would definitely be able to see like there was there would be advantages because you worked a job you kind of like you probably knew the the benefits of time management which I think is so huge going to law school. But do you do you think like do you feel like you were behind like because kids were graduating law school at 23, 24 or or um, or maybe like 25 or do you feel like um, you know you you were glad that you took those years off. For me, I can only speak for myself, but for me, it was, that's the only way I could have done it. Yeah. You know, um, looking back at it now, it, it worked out the way that I think it should have. Yeah. Uh, I always think, hey, like, what if I would have gone at 23, 24 straight in, where would I be now? Right. Uh, you know, with a few more years under my belt. But for me, it was, it just made sense to do, do it you that think way. those few extra years, like, helped you uh, before going to law school, like, do you think going to law school a little older like helped you sort of like um, like see things differently though? Like while you were there as opposed to maybe some other kids and I don't know, like maybe, maybe not like, maybe not, I don't know if you went to the bar or like you like to do different things. Like were you just sort of more buckled down a little bit and focused, do you think? Oh no, I, I enjoyed myself. Okay. Um, I think, I think you're right though. You're uh, being a little bit older had, um, some more experiences, some life experiences under my belt um, and knew for me that uh, I really didn't have, there was no second choice. Um, you know, uh, I looked at it as kind of you either do this or you don't. And at this point I'm spending my own money. Right. Which, uh, and, and as you know, it's expensive. So, so I, I figured if I'm going to do this, let's, let's jump in, let's do it all the way and do as best, do as best as I could. Um, 
you know, it, it, there's probably some advantages. I just don't know what they are because yeah. Again. Yeah, no, for sure. So you get out of law school, you pass the bar. What was your first job like? And I want to, I want to hear what your first job was like. You don't have to mention any names, but I also want to hear about leading up to like how many jobs you had before you finally got into your role at Christensen. One. One. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to cough here again. I'm sorry. A little That's okay. That's all right. <clears throat> but yeah, I had, I had one job. I worked for about a year. Okay. General practice in my hometown. Okay. And I uh, worked with the only attorney that I knew growing up. Uh, John so it was Patterson. hard to get the job or was he just like the town attorney? Like everybody went to him for like a will, for like a DUI, for like a, was that like what it was like or no? I'll, uh, I guess, let, let me set, kind of set this up a little bit. Yeah. There's, there's a story to it. Great. I, so I didn't know any lawyers growing up, never met a lawyer. Uh, <clears throat> John Patterson's his name. A famous lawyer at, um, in that area, and I think he's well known throughout the state. His father was a very well known lawyer who also was a senator, a prosecutor, practiced till he was like 103 years old. Um, so well known, family, their, their sons, one of them's you know, a lawyer at Sears, a, a very good family. Uh, I went to him for advice when I was thinking about going to law school. Okay. And he said, You're going to do it for the money, go sell insurance. Okay. And so he, it wasn't that he was discouraging, but it was more of do it for the right reasons. Right. Uh, went to law school. And uh, unfortunately, my father died my last semester of law oh, school. Sorry. Yeah. And he and my father had grew up together and went to high school together. And he was at the funeral and he saw me give this eulogy. Right. So I called read, me, okay. uh, called me, I don't know maybe a month afterwards or something like that and said, Hey, when's the next time you're going to be around? Let, let's I'd like talk to you, you know, and see what, what's your, what are you thinking for your future? And we got together and we started talking and said, look, why don't you come work for me? I, I saw, and he was a trial attorney. Wow. Um, and he said, Hey, why don't you come work for me? And I, I saw what you did that had been incredibly difficult. You kept good composure. It, it made sense. And, you know, you just kind of had that, that X factor that I'm okay. looking for. And he, he was the town attorney, but he had a couple of attorneys that worked for him. Okay. Uh, he was the older, he was older on in his practice. Yes, of course, sure. And I went there and uh, loved it, learned so much. Uh, not only what I wanted to do, but also what I, I got to experience what I didn't want to do. Of course, uh, yeah. You know, because as you say, it is, it's the, it's the town attorney, he's the general practice. You go in there if you need a will, you go in there if yeah. you got a DUI, you go in there, if you've been on a car wreck, um, whatever, whatever it is. So you got exposure to everything. So, so how long were you with him? I was with him. So as soon as I, I was with him before I even took the bar exam. Yeah. <clears throat> so like a year and a half. Oh, okay. Period. So you worked for him for a year and a half total? Yes. Okay. Was it hard to leave because of like that sort of, I don't want to say emotional, but there was like sort of a connection, you know, with you guys and. Hopefully you guys still talk. I don't know the, what's going on, but um, still ask him for advice to this day. Maybe you guys even kick him cases. Who knows? You know, like he's got this. Uh, so. Yeah, I, I mean, I still ask him for advice yep. to this day. Uh, you know, he's got so much experience and knowledge. It was it was difficult to leave, but it wasn't. There was no animus to it. It's actually he he encouraged me. Okay. And said, "Hey, look, I, I can see you want to do personal injury and you want to do trial." Right. You're not going to get that here. You might be able to try a case once every five, one, you know, you might be able to try a car wreck case once every five years. Um, and I told him who I had talked to, you know, and that I was going to meet with this guy, Dave Christensen. Um, and he knew the name and yep. uh, said, you know, go for it. Do so how it. did you find each other? Like, how did you and Dave connect? I stalked him. <laughs> That's what you have to do. That's any good attorney would do that. Yeah, sure. I, I believe that. I mean, well, not, you know, maybe like persistence, uh, but, but persistence is huge. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I don't know how many phone calls and emails it took. Interestingly, uh, so how it came about is we have our, you know, Association for Justice. You know, there's the yep. American one. Michigan has theirs. It's the old Trial Lawyers Association. Right. 
he had put a post on there that uh, a Sarah, I think you talked to Sarah Stumke Kime. Yep. She was going on maternity leave with her first child. Okay. Uh, and <clears throat> they needed somebody for three months. And I knew that if I could just get somewhere, because I was having a tough time even getting the door because I knew nobody down here. So you took the, did you take the plunge? Like <clears throat> left the job and you're like, I'll be there. I'll go in for three months. I'll, I'll go out 90 days, temporary. Sure, I'll and do it. how far, you said this was three hours away from where you were working, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So you had to get like, you had to pick up your life and like get in a place to live and like that sort of thing. Is that how it worked out? I, I came down the weekend before I was supposed to, uh, it was uh, 2015 Easter weekend, came down drove around, had no idea where I was going, found an apartment that I could, had enough money to afford the first month's rent, Right. Uh, put it down, went to work on Monday and worked, you know, for that, for my first couple of years, I bet you I worked 60 hours a week. Yep. Tried to work every day. Just well, Wasn't just, it a uh, three month deal though? At first it was a three month deal, right? It was after about uh, five weeks, Dave said, Hey, look, but you, I need to, I'm going to hire you full time. Wow. Keep you so Dave, that speaks to Dave because you took a big risk, mm -hmm. right? You left a full-time job in a place you were comfortable at your hometown. You drove three hours with no place to live and you, you know, you could afford it. You drove around, you found a place to live because you had this amazing opportunity to work with Dave Christensen. And after five weeks, um, Dave, you obviously were shining, doing a good job. And Dave said, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to hire you. I think it had more to do with the fact that I was here at 6.37 every morning. I wasn't leaving until 7 o'clock at night. Well, I mean, it's not like you knew anybody there. Like, what else were you going to do? <laughs> no, yeah, I didn't, didn't know any. Well, my, so my wife, who That's at the time was. That, wife, well, I think, hold on. Let's just shine a light on that, man. Like, that is really cool. Like, that's that's a great part of your story. And, like, I really just want to, like, appreciate that for a second. So congratulations to you for, like, getting out of your comfort zone and, like, doing that. Well, I, I, I can't give all the credit to myself. Oh. My wife, Ashley, who uh, greatest person in the world, rock, she moved with me and quit her job as a nurse. Wow. And took a job. She could, you know, nurse at that time, you had a job like. Yeah. But yep. she, picked, she quit her job that she was, I think she might have even taken a pay cut. Well, so she believed in you, man. Like that's, that's a huge yeah. thing. That, what a wonderful woman. Oh, absolutely. I mean, so, to, to do that. And, and she did it because she knew I wanted to. Right. right? Um, she didn't have to. And it was probably financially not in her best interest. No, I mean, but you got to take a step back to take a step forward sometimes. And, you know, behind, I don't know what the cliche is, but behind like a, I don't, I don't know. I don't even want to say like behind the man's like a, like a, a good strong woman. woman, I think. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. That's probably like dated and I'm trying to sound trying to sound endearing but it's probably like not very uh socially you know right to say anymore but i but in any event i think that's 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 incredible good that's good so you guys yeah. hey, any 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 dis worthwhile decision i've ever made she's had a hand in and um is has made the right decision probably based on her counsel well that's great yeah that's a good woman so he says, I'm going to hire you on after five months. And so like, what did you say? You were like, okay, like, let's get a better apartment. Or were you just sort of like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I actually, I remember, uh, I'm trying to think, he, I think he called me and he said, Hey, look, uh, you don't have anything going on. I'd, I'd like for you to work full time. And I absolutely, you know, that's <clears throat> what I wanted. And interestingly, so when I start, I knew kind of Dave's reputation, you know, you research who you're going to go to work yeah. for, but you don't know the person until you start to work for the person. Right. And then you meet people in the community that know them and are like, oh, you're working for Dave Christensen? Really? You know, what, what's it like? I, I've heard this. I've heard that, you know. And at this time, he had just gotten an $18 million verdict as right. well. Right. So you're like, wow, you know, stunned. You know, what did I get myself into kind of, am I over my head? Wow. That's yeah. That's uh, but you know, I, sometimes when you feel that way, I feel like, you know, you're in the right place because you don't mm -hmm. want to do something that's like too easy for you. And like, you just feel like you need to grow more. So you had room to grow, right? Oh, absolutely. I, and I was here, I think around my 
two and a half to three months. And he goes, hey, you're going to go try this case. Here you go. I, I didn't even, I didn't know how to try a case, yeah. right? I had no idea. Um, and he helped me get through it. And it was, there was a lot of times where I was going, I, I just, I, you're doubting yourself, right? Yeah. I'm, yeah. Just quit. I, I can't do this. I can't figure out. And what's different about Dave is that it wasn't just here, you're going to go try this case, figure it out. It was, okay, you need to write an opening statement. Go write your opening statement, bring it back to them. All right, this isn't working. You need to, you need to move this to here. This is how it should be laid out. This is your logical progression. You're not thinking about this. Okay, you have to go across this doctor or take this direct examination, lay it out for me. And then you do that and he goes, all right, what are you gonna do when the doctor says this? What are you gonna do when the doctor says that? So it was actually teaching the fundamentals of it. He as was a, a mentor too. Like you, he was absolutely yeah. investing those tools in you as opposed to a lot of, you know, I know a lot of people that their bosses or whoever just says, go, go try it, go figure it out. Well, it sounds like you had a couple of people in your life who uh, saw a lot of potential in you, including your wife and Dave Christensen, who invested time in you and uh, wanted to, you know, make, help you but be the lawyer that obviously they thought you, uh, you could be. And, you know, probably where, where you are today. So like how many years ago is that? Like how long have you been with, with Dave now? I've been Dave, with Dave for six years, just over six years. Wow. Now. Okay. Yep. So tell us now like about, about like your practice, like, um, like what, what cases you're trying, like, like unless I don't want to leave anything out from like the past with that, but um, if there was something else you wanted to tell us about the early days of working for Dave, you can, you're welcome to. No, I think, I mean, it kind of it progresses in that way of just uh, investing in you until you get to be a better attorney. And now uh, some of it due to my own personal goals and some of it due to our laws moving um, a lot more. So I used to do, Michigan, we have PIP, personal injury protection right. uh, benefits, no fault benefits. It's this weird uh, system that you try to explain to people that aren't from Michigan and they go, well, what are you talking about? Right. So basically, if you get in a car wreck or a car crash, you have your economics and your non-economic uh, damages, right? And in most states, Massachusetts, I'm sure, uh, Indiana, Illinois, California, you file a lawsuit and you're getting your non-economics, but then you get your past economics, future economics, medical bills, wage loss, things like that. Right. We don't have that. You get in a car wreck here, all of your economics are paid by your insurance company. So your lawsuits for your economics are against your own insurance company for payment of your medical bills. Okay. And your medical bills up until recently are unlimited lifetime benefits. Wow. So you could have seven lawsuits against your insurance company. But then you'd have a separate lawsuit, what we call the third party lawsuit against the tort feeser. And in that case, one, you can only get non-economics except in some rare circumstances, some wa wages over three years if it's a permanent disability. But second to that, you also have to meet this threshold, this crazy threshold of a serious impairment of a body function, which is, that was supposed to be the trade-off. We'll get, you get your, all of your economics paid for from your insurance company in exchange we're not going to let, if you just get in a fender bender and have three weeks of chiropractic care to sue that other driver. Okay. You have to meet this threshold. So when we, when I see these awesome verdicts and, you know, I have so many of these guys that I just love and follow, you know, Keith Mitnick down right. in Florida, don't eat the bruises, big influence, Nicholas Rowling, his wife, Courtney Rowling, probably one of not only best female attorneys, but one of the best attorneys in the yeah. country. Yeah. Uh, these, they, they get these insane verdicts, right? These eight, nine, 10 figure verdicts. And you just are in awe and you're wondering, why can't I do that? And then you realize, oh, we don't get futures here, right? We can't get future, econo future um, uh, damages for economics. Yeah. You know, we, we, can't, we don't do life planning uh, for you know, catastrophic injuries. That's all taken through. So it's, it's purely a, a non-economic, case and you got to meet that threshold wow okay. so a lot of cases get bounced on threshold you don't meet the threshold so okay 
Wow. Okay. So how, how many have you, would you say you've done like a lot of trials or like most of your cases settle? Um, so I have a pretty heavy docket, but I uh, try two or three cases a year. Okay. Uh, I actually tried a case in March of 2020, started the Monday before Michigan went into lockdown. Yeah. So we picked a jury Monday, Wednesday, the judge tells us, hey, we just got these orders from the Supreme Court. They're suspending the civil jury trials. Right. And we were like, oh, so what do we do? You know, we, I didn't, and at this time, right, you, you heard of COVID, but you didn't really know Nobody what did. it was. It was just kind of this rumor and right. a little bit on the news. Uh, we got together with the judge and the, uh, the defense attorney and we bit, let's speed this thing up. And we ended up you know, getting a verdict the next day. And I can't remember if it was Friday or Monday. So either the next day or the day after they, we went into lockdown. Yeah. And we've been there ever since Monday, our court or this coming Monday, the, uh, not, or the 12th, I'm starting a jury trial and it'll be the first one, jury trial. And it's in the same venue where I tried my last case. So I tried okay. the last case there. I'm going to try the first case there. So that's awesome. So you feel a little comfortable being there. And, uh, yeah. But yeah, I, I think it's pretty cool. You know, you get to go back to where, where it all started. Yeah. Oh, for sure. But you're far from done. So. Oh, yeah, that. absolutely. <laughs> Everybody. I mean, my trial schedule for the rest of this year is insane. Is it? I'll definitely get caught up from missing trials last year. Yeah. So what are these legislative changes like I'm hearing about the recently in, implemented, like, uh, you know, that affected you all and, uh, Change your approach to the practice, excuse me. Yeah, the, so that it's about our no fault law. Okay, all right, that was the no fault. All right, gotcha. Yeah, it started in 2019 is when it passed and it's kind of gone in in different implemented stages. We haven't really seen the, the full effects of it yet because it took a year before new policies were being issued. Uh, but essentially this is what it did is we went from this um, mandated unlimited lifetime medicals to now you purchase different levels for your personal injury protection. So for your, your medical benefits, some states, I think it's called med pay. Some states, I think still call it PIP as well, but so you can purchase, uh, depending on what type of health insurance you have, anywhere from 50 to 250 or unlimited. Okay. Now, the kind of this, how it's become this hybrid system is if you have economic damages greater than what your policy affords, you can now try and get, go get those in your lawsuit against the other driver, which is a little different. Okay. I don't think there's been a trial on it yet. There's tons and tons of litigation going on uh, in the circuit courts and working its way through the appellate courts. If you're an appellate lawyer right now in Michigan, doing uh, Michigan no fault, yep. auto PIP, you'd be set for the next 10, probably 15 years with work. It's nobody, wow. nobody knows it's uncertain, which okay. is the, which is an opposite of what the law is supposed to do is give us some certainty and predictability, right? That's what it's all about. So <laughs> Dustin, tell me about politics. Like you were, I mean, I think like maybe you once had aspirations to be in uh, politics and you've like worked with some big political figures. What's, what's the deal with that? Let's... Yeah. So um, I was, I was saying before I went to law school and I was doing this kind of community outreach, community liaison, yep. I was uh, really loved politics and was involved in history not loved the news, loved everything that was going on, loved okay. talking to guys in their 60s and 70s, getting their perspectives. Yeah, that's awesome. And so in that, I, I, this was before even applying to law school, I was working and volunteering on local campaigns, uh, state representatives, state senators, people I liked and admired, uh, doing the door knocking. I don't know if you've yep. ever had to do door knocking uh, for someone. But it, if you want to be a trial attorney, I suggest it to anyone, anybody out there, because you have to find a way to relate to those people. Otherwise, they're slamming the door in your face and telling you to get off their yeah, lawn. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. You know, so that was it was great. Got to work with um, John Espinosa. He was a, he was a, the only Democrat ever elected 
uh, that I know of from San Alac County. Okay. Uh, and served three terms there in the House. Uh, Jim Barsha, who was, they call him the Dean of the Senate. He, from the time that he graduated from college until he retired, his life was all in government, very knowledgeable, knew the system, knew the players. Okay. Uh, Jeff Mays, he was an up and comer, got to work with him and work on his campaign and really get to, to see how things, things move in, in those circles. So it was, it was, it was great. Went to law school though, and then took constitutional law class and realized that politics wasn't all that it's cracked up to be. It's a little, there's a little bit of corruption in there. You know, mm -hmm. I think I had this uh, dramatic feeling about yeah. it, you know, yeah. this nostalgia yeah. of its 1960s right. JFK and, you know, Tip O'Neill guys like that. Right. No, I understand that. But uh, you're very young. Hey, you never know. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? Like, you, ne you just never know. Uh, no, you, no, yeah. I, I agree. I know, you know, I know a lot of people, too. I always say, you know, I'd never want to be a judge. Uh, yeah, uh, it just it doesn't really appeal to me. But I know a lot of attorneys that they practice, you know, 10, 15 years, and their minds change and decide, hey, that's, that's exactly what I want to do. That's going to be my next chapter. So who knows? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so Dustin, what do we leave out today? Is there anything that I've, uh, I haven't covered? Is there anything you want to tell uh, the lawyer stories community? You know, I think the only thing, if you're someone that is here and you're wondering if I should go to law school or maybe you're a first year lawyer, or you're just starting out your practice um, with someone or hanging a shingle is, you know, take some risks, you know, nobody's going to care five years down the road. Our, our egos are big that we think that everyone's going to say, oh, I, he failed. He didn't make it in law school or, you know, he only made it one year out on his own or, you know, whatever those things are, you just brush yourself up, you get off. I think that's great I'm, advice. I'm, you know, I'm not going to try this case because I'm afraid to lose, you know, and it is scary and you're going to lose. I mean, it's just, that's just a fact, but you know, you're, you're not going to get, if you want to be a trial lawyer, uh, one of the, th one of the, my best advice is you can't be a trial lawyer without trying cases. Right. That's how you get better at it. That's right. I think that's great advice. Like not as many people are looking at you as you think are, you got to like do what, you know, you got to do what you, uh, what you want to do and don't, don't worry about the judgment of others. Yeah, we, we, we have so much expectations from family or friends or our ideas are different than theirs. You know, I know I was living with a, a few guys, some friends before going to law school and they're kind of like, why, why are you gonna, you're going to quit your job? What? I know. You're, you're going to move? What? You're going to go back to school? Like, you know, it just it, to them, it was just such a foreign concept, but it, right. it, was, it was worth it, you know, and same, same as you, it worked out in the end and hopefully four more years, I can come back and we can see uh, what you're up to, where you, where you're, the lawyer stories has progressed. Hey, we'd love to. Weekly PBS show. That, you know what? Hey, I'm just waiting to get signed, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. No, we'd, we'd love to. Yeah, we'd love to do that. Um, but yeah, so I just don't want to leave anything out, Dustin. Uh, it was amazing to talk to you. You've, you've done some great things. You should be very proud. Um, and you know, you're like humble too. Like that's, that's cool, man. Like you, you've done a lot of cool things. Like you really have a good story um, about, especially, you know, moving to a place where not really knowing anybody and you took a chance. People have to take risks and um, you know, congratulations on all your success. You're doing great. Yeah. I think that's, um, I don't know, maybe so much look at it as being humble, but I, I know I definitely uh, approach things uh, probably from, as we were talking about as being young and growing up that, everybody's smarter, faster, stronger, yep. better. And you just need to work, you need to work harder. And hopefully, you know, you find a four leaf clover or a couple pennies and you get some luck. That's it. Wise words from uh, attorney Dustin Hoff. So uh, thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much how, for having me. How can everybody get a hold of you? You can reach me uh, by phone at 248-213-4900. Or through our website, it's David Christensen, C H R I S T E N S E N law.com. 
Very and good. I'd be happy to speak to anyone anytime. We got a referral, refer a case. Love to take it. There we go. Or you could uh, message me if you need to get a hold of uh, Dustin Hoff or the rest of the Christensen Law gang. Uh, thanks again for being here. And everybody out there, wherever you are in the world today, enjoy yourselves. Cheers. Cheers.